welcome to GCAF. Uh, welcome for those of us who are here physically and for those of us who are joining online. Uh, once again, you are all the more welcome to come here and join us to gather here physically with, with us. And we, it would be a joy no? and for our mutual encouragement as well that we could see one another, not just digitally, but physically again. Now, we'd also like to acknowledge that we are graced uh, by the presence of our DMS right now, our brand new DMS, uh, Larry Montesclaros and his beloved wife, uh, Henny. You're, we're so glad that you're here and it's your lovely children. No? They're all here. The four of them are here. And uh, we are now at the 12th week of our series on the book of Hebrews. And we have titled this series, the, the whole the entire book, no? that it is to be anchored in Christ. And we've stressed no, that the importance of how you never know what you get in life. You, know, you never know what happens in life, but if you are anchored in Christ, if we can hear and, and always know the Word of God, then you're, you're not going to get lost in life. You're not going to get tossed by the waves. You're not going to get blown away by the wind, but you'll always be anchored. You're always going to be standing rock solid in Christ and that's the way we all should live. And today, I'd like to title my, my message no, that uh, uh, as fully satisfied. Do you believe that it is possible to live life each day being fully satisfied? That the, you know, I hear an amen, praise the Lord. And it is not just, you know, that, that we are going to be fully satisfied in heaven, but we could be fully satisfied today. Right? And so I hear an amen again. Praise the Lord. And so now what we're going to do is we are going to go to the Word of God and we're going to pray and then we're going to start. So Hebrews 5, 1 to 10 tells us, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men, in things pertaining to God, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because if of, of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins. As for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest. But he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever, according to to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we are praying that your word that is always true, always trustworthy, always relevant for all of us here in all seasons, whether we be young or whether we be of advanced age, whether we are facing small circumstances or huge troubles, your word remains solid. Your reward remains important. I pray, O oh Lord, that we, by the word that we listen today, your word and not ours, we would learn to be fully satisfied and where we can get this satisfaction from. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there are things in life that you need to know. Things in life that you, you must know in order to make sense of anything. You could wake up each day, you see, and, and 
force yourself to wake up, get up from bed, get out of your house, go to where you, you need to go, work, school, buy, buy essential goods, whatever. But if you don't know these important details in your life, you're going to come home tired. You're going to be wasting, uh, spending all your day thinking, what am I, what am I here for? What, what's the purpose of life? Why, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why is life like this? Why is life so hard? And, and life would, be, would have no meaning. And there's, there's no satisfaction in that kind of life. It's a miserable existence to keep forcing yourself to wake up in the morning and not knowing what's going to happen and what's gonna, what's gonna, how your life is going to end up. And all you're thinking are problems here, left and right, and so many things left to do, and so many things, and so many places to go. If you don't know these important details in your life, you're never going to find a satisfaction in your life. Your heart will always wonder, is there anything more than this? Is there anything better than this? And that is the heart of a discontented person. That is the heart of someone who, who, who thinks, this is not it. There must be something more. There must be something else. This is a life that I don't want, right? And there's always going to be that discontent in you and you are living a life, my dear friend, of not being satisfied. And so I pray that the Word of God will satisfy you today. It's like this. It's like being given a map and told to go to a place. You see, as we navigate in the book of Hebrews, we're told to go here. No? We're, go, we're told to go there. We're told to go to, to an occasion, a command. No? We're, all, we're told on occasion, a reminder. We're told on occasion about a grand, majestic picture. But we're heading towards a direction. So it's like being given a map. And, and one of the most notorious places, no? the hardest to navigate, in the area of Cagayan de Oro City is in the area of Nazareth. That you could be born in Cagayan de Oro and still get lost. And in fact, uh, two months ago, three months ago, I once again got myself lost in that uh, wonderful place because the familiar road that I was treading, the, the route I always take, was blocked. There was a construction going on. You see? And since there was a construction going on, everything that was familiar to me was, was I couldn't pass it. I, I couldn't pass through. So I had to try other roads. I was forced to turn to a road that I never would take ordinarily because the road was under construction. And not only that, I'd go to another place. It's a dead end now because it's under construction. So I got lost. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about as well if you're, you're living in Cagayan de Oro. But we know that there's also brothers and sisters here who don't. So we have this place there that's really, really hard because the roads are crisscrossing everywhere. And, and some of them lead to dead ends. Now, what if you're given a map? And, and you're told, okay, you start here, you're here, and then you must go to this place that's marked with an X. Okay, so you can follow the directions. You could say, okay, in, in, in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven streets, I'll go, I'll turn right. Okay, and then after two streets, I'll turn left. And then after that, I'll turn maybe two blocks, another right, and then another. So I could follow those directions. Just as we would read Hebrews and we could follow through the, with the words. You could, you could start from chapter one and you'd end with the last chapter. You'd, you'd probably hear that and you'd probably finish the book but then, and then reach the end. You could live life like that, no? You could follow directions, get up, report for work at the eight, get home before the wife gets angry and, and, you know, live life like that. But then, once you get to the, the destination, you ring the doorbell, you knock on the door, and the person comes out asking, who are you looking for? What are you, what do you want? Right? When, when a stranger knocks on your door, of your house and you open the window and you're you're the one that is living in the house you open the window diba? 
those would be the first two questions you're going to ask. Who is it? Who are you looking for? What do you want? And if it's not somebody with a Lazada or a Shopee package, he's not going to be welcome. Right? Because just imagine if the person asks you, who are you looking for and what do you want? And you're just standing there, um, I don't really know. You see, I was given a map. I was told that I, I could come here, but I don't really know who's here. And I don't really know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I just ended up here. It could be true with life. It could be true with your faith in God. That you could live life, no? be a good Christian. You, you go do everything is asked of you. Follow directions. But then, do you know Him? Will He know you? Do you know why you're going through all these motions? Even if it's not driven from a personal knowing of God, then it would be a tragedy, right? That you could live life not really knowing, just doing things, but not having this personal knowledge of the Savior. And that, again, my dear friends, is not the life of, I want you to live. It's not the life of full satisfaction. So as we tread along in Hebrews, I don't want you to miss out why we're going, where we're going with this. I don't want you to miss out why the author wrote this book and why he keeps saying what he's saying. We just read a passage about Jesus Christ, him being a high priest, and this some other high priest. What is, has what is that got to do with my life? The book of Hebrews was written to encourage a group of people, believers in Christ, who were facing a crisis. They were at a crisis, a crisis of faith. Some of whom they knew that were with them just a while ago, maybe a long time or a while ago, were no longer there. Some of them had already given up. And there's just this group remaining and also, they're thinking, is it worth it? Is living life like this worth it? Is following Jesus worth it? We're having a crisis here, and is it worth it to keep living like this? Is there anything better than this? Because we keep hearing voices. You know, some priest down in that temple is inviting me. You know, some other opportunities are out there. There might be something better, and that's seemingly their situation. So the pastor who's writing this sermon down because he can't be with them physically, is sending to them this letter, this, this written sermon, so that they could be read and the people reading it would be encouraged. And how is he encouraging this group of people that's in a crisis? It's out of this world. Instead of telling them how they can solve their problem, or how they can get out of their problem, he's think, telling them to do this. Look to Jesus. Look at Jesus. Chapter 1, it starts with a great view of the supremacy of Christ. That Jesus, there's nothing else better than Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus. He's better than prophets. He's better than angels. And not only that, he's telling you, listen to Jesus. Only to Jesus. Your inner voice is telling you whatever it is. Your, there's other voices telling you whatever it is. Don't listen to them. Listen to Jesus. This is the pastor's answer on how he could encourage a group of people who's thinking to give up. Look at Jesus. He's better. Listen to Jesus. He can, you can trust Him. Trust in Jesus. This is what he's doing. Again and again, you'll see. No? And every time, he'll insert a command. He'll, he'll insert a warning. But it will always be propelled. It will always be launched and fueled by this wonderful knowing of the truth of who Jesus is. 
And I don't want you to miss this when you read the book of Hebrews because he loves to do this. The writer loves to compare and contrast. He likes to compare and contrast. He likes to use this. But you know what? You use this. You do this all the time. We all do this all the time. How? Every time you go to a grocery and you pick up a can of uh, sardines, what are you going to do? You are going to compare brand number, number, number to a brand Y. Uh, how much is it? Okay. How much does it weigh? How, how, how heavy is it? Like, ilang, ilang gramo, right? And then, what are you going to do? Mm, I remember the taste. Which is better? What are you doing? You're, you're trying to see which is better. You compare and contrast if you want to see and determine which is better. And why do you want to do that? Because from the little decisions to the big decisions, every decision that you make that you think is important for you, you will compare and contrast. From building a house, from canvassing something online for your online shopping needs, what are you going to do? You're always going to canvas. You're always going to compare, contrast. What are the similarities here? What are the differences? What are, what are the things here that will stand out? Why? Because you are, you are going to make a choice, right? You're going to have to choose one. And once you make the choice, check out Bayad, right? You're going to be paying for it. And you don't want your hard-earned money to go where you think it is inferior. It is something that is not worth it. So you're always going to compare and contrast because you want to know which is better, which is worth it for you to choose. And, the, and this sermon does a lot of comparisons and contrasts for you. Because they're in a crisis. They're, 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 they're hearing a lot of voices. They're, they're, they're becoming unsure. Where, where is better? Where, where do we, who, who do we go? Who do we listen to? Where do we go? Who do we trust? And he's comparing and contrasting. And we do that when we need to determine which is which, which is better. And who is he contrasting this? Every time you will see that he will always compare and contrast with Jesus and everyone else. With Jesus and everything else. You know, our heart has an internal weighing scale. It will automatically weigh every time we're told to make a choice. We're going to weigh which is it in our heart. And if your heart looks like this, that after you've considered everything you, you know about Jesus, you've read the Bible, you, maybe you've heard, heard a lot of sermons, and you're weighing things in your heart, and your weighing, the weighing scale in your heart looks like this. That after considering everything you've heard, everything you know about Jesus, and you will still think that everything else and everyone else is better than Jesus, that, my dear friends, is the recipe for total disaster for your life. You're never going to be fully satisfied. I asked my wife, what if... G, that you were given, you know, the best of the best in the world. You know, you, ha just, you just have the best of the best. And then my wife said, what? What, what, what best of best? Just imagine with me that you have the best of the best in the world, but you don't have a garden hose. That's literally what I said. Wala kang hose para pang bisbis. And she said, and I asked her, will you be satisfied? Will you be content? And she said, well, I have the best of the best, but I don't have a garden hose. I still need something. I still lack something. So what's, what's the effect there? You're, you're always going to be, yeah, I have this, but I need other things too. So you're never going to be satisfied, right? Because that's our heart. Our heart is a black hole. Nothing ever fills it completely. You could be filled one day and be hungry the next. That's your heart. And if your heart says that everything else and everyone else is just better, tastes better than Jesus, 
uh, is pr more precious than Jesus, is, uh, m m sounds more uh, a better solution than Jesus, then you're never going to be fully satisfied. You're going to live each day looking out the window and, and, and see where, where, which is better. I need to be somewhere better. I need to live better. I need to do better. You're never going to be satisfied. This life, I don't like it because I lack so many things. But if your heart looks like this, that after you've considered Jesus, after you've looked at Jesus, after you've learned about Jesus and His Word, and you've discovered that, hey, Jesus is better. Jesus is simply better than everyone else and everything else. And I tell you, this, my dear friend, is the heart that will be satisfied no matter what. No matter what. This is a life that can say, I am 100% fully satisfied today, yesterday, and forever. Now, why is, it, why is it, he's compared, okay? So the comparisons and contrasts he's done already is about angels and prophets. Jesus is simply better than Moses. Jesus is simply better than angels. Jesus is simply better than everyone else there. Now, what is he going to do? He's going to compare Jesus as a high priest compared to every other high priest as well. So we've got to understand because we're not Jews, we're not Hebrews, we didn't grow up in a Hebrew home knowing what a priest does. So we, we better understand how do you end up being a high priest in the first place and what do they do in day, right? So in verse 1, the requirement for a high priest is that you must be from among men. I mean, you must be human. And from the, among humankind, God will choose, God will appoint, God will call one, and he will now become the high priest. And there's a difference no, between a prophet because with God, God will give or, or select someone, and we also know that messengers were sent, no? but we're talking about prophets, so uh, angels, I mean. So God will say, hey, I got a message for, my, for the people. And he'll, he'll call a prophet, and the prophet will now bring the message to the people. But that's not the function of a priest. The priest functions like this. God will select from the men, from every man, every tribe, uh, every uh, no of uh, everyone in the tribe of Levites, and what happens? He will now select one to become the priest, a high priest, and the priest is now tasked to represent everyone in every matters in behalf of man pertaining to God. That is the function and role of a priest. The priest role is to represent men, his congregation, and their needs to God. And that's why he is going to be offering, because what is the need of, for, of men? What is the, the, the most essential need of men in behalf of God? They need to be forgiven for their sins. Otherwise, they're going to die. Otherwise, there's no, no, no hope. And so the priest's function is to carry out that essential, essential task before God and saying, Lord, we have sinned before you, and these are the sacrifices for our sins so that God would say, I am satisfied. You are forgiven. See, God has a law. In order for forgiveness to be given, His law must be satisfied. And that is good and that is just. And that is entirety of our, even our justice system as we know it here in the Philippines. That if you have a crime, there is a law. And the law is to be satisfied before there is freedom again. Now, other than that, the priest should also have the temperament. Okay? He must be able to deal gently. You don't just have someone say, I want to be a high priest. I have an ambition. I want to be a high priest. He must be called and appointed by God. Nobody can appoint himself and say, oh, I want to be a leader in the church. I want to be you know, a high priest. No. What happens here is that he has to be appointed and called. And not only that, he has to have the character, the temperament, the right maturity. Why? 
because he must deal gently with the ignorant and the misguided. That is his role, right? Now, that, the, the, the gently here is a wonderful, wonderful word. The Greek word for that is called metriopatheia. And it's the middle ground between, between the emotion of extra, extravagant grief, extreme sorrow, a broken heart, from ex extreme and utter indifference. Walang paki. Okay? So, so, gently here is the middle ground between extreme sorrow and extreme indifference. And you want your high priest to be gentle. You want your high priest not to react with extravagant grief every time you come to him and say, Oh, <laughs> you see the kid? Oh! Right? And, and, and so, so mad at you, right? You, want, you don't also want to go approach a high priest that would say, Who are you? I don't know you. I don't care. You talk to my hand. You want a high priest who will feel sorrow, but not also going to be harsh with you. Not only that, this word is so good because, you know what? We always love the word patience. You know, be, please be patient with me. You know who's the father of patience? This word, gently, metriopatheia. Patience, anak ka lang, right? Someone better than you is metriopatheia, gentle. This is what a high priest should be, that he should be even more than patient, uh, than a patient person. The metriopatheia is so wonderful that this is the, the character that you're always going to be ready to be reconciled with someone who has hurt you, offended you, even personally. That every time you would come in and, 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 and repentance and ask for forgiveness, the person will always be ready. You're never going to see this person with his arms crossed, his back turned on you and say, Ayoko na, two times is enough, six times is enough, Right? You've done this so many times. Uh, some Greek used it, no, no, somebody with no patrenia would never, never wanted to reconcile. And we know, dear brothers and sisters, that we're, we, we do this, right? We lose our metriopatheia when we feel we've been abused. We feel we've been, you know, hurt so many times. We say, Yohana, I've given you so many chances. And we know we have a limit to our metriopatheia. But the high priest should never run out of metropathia. But us human, our human hearts, we know we fail in this. Another thing about the high priest is that him being gentle means he has the ability to put up with people without being or getting irritated. And I love that because this is me. I get irritated a lot, even from my own family. The ones I love. Can you say that ironic that the ones I love are the ones that irritate me the most? Meaning, yes, I can deal gently with them in many days, but there are some days that I just say, you know what? Ah, oh, I'm irritated. See? The sight of you irritates me. <laughs> the sound of you irritates me. And I run out. And we, but we have, we, if we could have a high priest that will never get irritated and put up with, with me because I know I, I, I would deserve to, be, to get irritated at and many times, then that's a wonderful thing. Another thing about this high priest and his requirement is that he must have the ability not to lose his temper with people when they are so foolish that they seemingly don't learn. From their sins and they do the same thing again and again and again and again can you imagine the role of the high priest every day of the atonement and all these thousands and hundreds of people approach him we have sinned please offer a sacrifice for us and the priest would say Ikaw na naman, suki. Ito na naman. again you see i have a record of you all year 2000 Year 1995, same entry, right? 
Just imagine how devastating it would be. But we could have a high priest that no matter how many times we've sinned, we could approach him and, and ask for forgiveness and be treated with gentle manner, being treated without him being irritated, being ready forever and ever to be reconciled again. Wouldn't it be better? And we would have this, this attitude is that it doesn't get angry at the fault of others. And it doesn't con condone them either. Hindi to consentador. You don't like to go to a priest who consents and, and, and does nothing with sin. Who just says, oh, it's okay, babayaan mo na yan. Pasensya na lang. Right? He doesn't condone sin, but he doesn't condemn. He's ever ready to offer forgiveness if you come to him and ask for forgiveness. That is the role. That is what a high priest should be. But we know human high priests can't live up to these standards. The best of us can't live up to these standards. Is there anything better than the best of us then? Right? Now, take note of, because the first four verses here is the human high priests. Yes, you have the requirement here, the similarities. But here's it's verses 1 to 4 is talking about the human high priests. And the human high priest must do this and he must deal gently, but it's not a blanket statement, okay? It's not something that you deal gently with everyone. It's only deal gently with a specific group of people. The other group of people you deal harshly. The, the gently here is for those who are ignorant and misguided. Do you know that the Bible categorizes the sins we do, the heart that we have, with someone that would, do, would be a sinner out of ignorance? And a sinner that is not ignorant and is not misguided, but still is a sinner. Both are sinners, mind you, huh? But the sins of ignorance is the sinners, the sinners or who do the sins of ignorance are the ones the high priest is for. You see, the high priest is not for unbelievers. The, the role and function of a high priest doesn't cater to unbelievers. You have to be a believer in order for your, for your high priest to function. So if you're an unbeliever, you need the gospel. You need to repent. You need to be saved. If you're a believer, you think you're, you're a believer, then you might want to think, um, am I here in this category? Let's see. Numbers 15, 22 to 21 tells us that those who sin because of being ignorant and misguided is this. You have the provision of the high priest to forgive you no matter what. And no matter how many times you mess up, no matter how many times you sin, uh, and unintentionally, you are forgiven. You come to him, ask for forgiveness, confess with your sins, with your mouth, you are forgiven. With the metropatheia, no matter how many times. But see, verses 22 to 29 would deal with that assurance. That if you sin unintentionally, that if you're a sinner, saved by grace, sin unintentionally, you are always assured to be forgiven by God. Because you have that wonderful high priest, Jesus. But, even here, in the Old Testament, and you'll find the same language in the New Testament, if you fall into the category, oh, sorry, let me, let me define first more about being the sins of ignorance. Uh, the Jews, they understood that it doesn't just mean you're ignorant. I don't know the law. See, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I lack knowledge. I'm ignorant of that truth. I'm ignorant of that fact. No, it covers more. You could, be, you could be aware of the truth. You could know the truth. And the sins is that even though you know the truth, okay, I'm not supposed to look at people and hold a grudge, okay? I'm not supposed to be unforgiving, but then I'm not supposed to be irritable. I'm not supposed to be, to, to, to burst out and say, you know, unwholesome words. But at the moment, at the impulse, your anger, your sin, your passion, the desire, you get tempted and you're overcome. And you sin. That's included. But take note that the sinner who does that 
If you're a child of God, you're guaranteed that you will be convicted to sin to a point that you will say, I repent. Convict, 100% guaranteed this is you because you have a new nature. You see, a believer, a child of God cannot remain in his sin. You cannot not repent. You will, at one point in your life, you're going to repent because you, you're not able going, you're not going to take it. You're going to say, why do I stay eating the, the food of pigs if I could go back to my daddy? And it's better there. Even if I just live like a servant, it's still better than my life and my sin right now. So meaning you're going to leave your sin. You're going to abandon it and repent and go to God. And you, my dear friend, are assured you're going to get forgiven. That's still in the category of being ignorant and misguided. But if you are now in another category that is no longer out of ignorance, is no longer out, out of, you know, the, 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 of a momentary weakness of sin but you are defiant your heart your heart is hard that no matter how much you know no matter how much the conviction you don't feel anything anymore you don't even want to repent anymore you are at peace with your sin what happens, my dear friends Hebrews warns you of that that the, the slow drifting away of not obeying, not obeying, not obeying, reaches a point that you will say, I don't even want to repent anymore. I don't, even, I don't even feel sorry for my sin anymore. I don't even feel the conviction anymore. I am now manhid. Okay? I don't care anymore. I love this sin more than God. See? And that would be defiant sin. And you are now going to be, by your actions, your own decisions, saying and refusing to go before God in repentance. You are reproaching God. You are reviling His name. You are blaspheming the Lord who has offered you the goodness and the best of His grace. And that, my dear friends, is why you see such a harsh reaction to the guilty person. To those whose heart is hard, you don't want to repent anymore. You have today. See, the Hebrews is so good. You have today, as long as this day is called today, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. But if you're living now, you're listening to this message, you have the chance and the grace of God to still repent. To leave that sin behind and to go to Him. And you can be assured you'll be forgiven. You might feel you're, you're not going to be forgiven. You've stayed in your sin too long. But I tell you, that's a lie. Repent, leave your sin behind. Go to Him and you will be forgiven. Let go of your pride. Let go of whatever it is. Go to Him. Now with that, that's who the high priest is for. That's for you and me. Now, in other, in, we could always say, no, now, the, the defiant sin is someone who's sinning with the full knowledge he knows what he's doing. He's made his choice. This is open-eyed, not... not not, uh, not literally a blind person, pabulag-bulag na, okay? Pa, pabungol-bungol na. He's heard, but it goes out in the other ear. He's seen, but he, he pretends to forget. That, my dear friends, is someone with a defiant heart of a sinner. And you're not going to find forgiveness if you don't seek forgiveness, my dear friends. That is the life that's going to lead you with disappointments after disappointments. Because you'll realize your resources will wane. Your strength will wane. You're going to be dissatisfied. There's going to be a better model. There's going to be a more beautiful, more handsome models out there. And you're never going to be satisfied. And that's the reason why. See, if you think that the... What, think about it. We could, we could argue the point that the high priest is the best among all of us. Why? Because from all the people... God chooses one to be a high priest. In order for that one person to represent the whole, I could say, we could say, you know, that, hey, that's man's best. Ah. That's the best that man has to offer. And if you could think of it, you know, that it's not just what man, the best that man has to offer, man's best, but also what the world has to offer, you could add it to, they will all disappoint. And I'll give you two reasons why. Because they are going to be inconsistent and insufficient. They're not going to fill your bottomless heart. 
you, you, from the human priests that were chosen, the high priests that were chosen, they were also beset with weakness. They were inconsistent. They were insufficient. You have an example of Aaron, the high priest. At one er point of his life, he is so wonderful, such a big help to Moses. Next point in his life, he's cursing Moses. He's telling to Moses, wow, we don't like your wife. Okay, we don't like your leadership. And he's letting people say, hey, let's reject Moses, our leader. And the next moment, you're seeing Aaron lead others to worship God. And next moment, you see Aaron worship, lead people to worship idols. We, human, the best, even the best among us, are inconsistent and insufficient. You see, I wish, how I wish you could say, I am consistent all the time in, in praying for you. And I don't, I'm not. I'm inconsistent. I'm insufficient. I'm limited. How I wish I could say, I know each and every one of you. I know the numbers of hair on your head. I don't, I don't even know uh, many of you by name. I can say hi, hello to you if I see you here. But you know what? Even here digitally, I can't go to you. I'm limited. We're all limited. The best of us are limited. We are inconsistent, insufficient. The best of the world is inconsistent, insufficient. It's going to wear out someday. It's going to get replaced someday. And if you think you're going to be satisfied in men's best or in the world's best, you are in for a harsh reality, my dear friends. They will disappoint you. That's why the writer is always saying, don't go there. Don't listen to them. Don't put your heart, don't you put, put your faith here. Put it in Jesus. Put it in Jesus. He's simply better. And he'll tell you two reasons why we could be fully satisfied in Jesus as our high priest. You see, Jesus is the only one that has fully satisfied every requirement of a high priest. He became human. He's fully God, fully human. He became appointed by God. And even God himself, his father, saying, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Acknowledges the fact he is the one. Jesus is not the one saying, okay, I want to be high priest. He's appointed. He's also called. And he did not glorify himself as to become a high priest, but the father who said to him that. Not only that, he fills the requirement that to be, to be the best of the human, to be appointed by God, he also is able to fulfill the metro, uh, being gentle. I forgot the Greek word there to pronounce. In the, Greek, in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears. You, you want someone who loves you so much and loves you so much that he would sacrifice his own life to save you. You want someone not only who has sacrificed a lot, but would also understand whatever you are going through. You don't have someone who is indifferent with you. You don't have someone who, you know, has done a lot about you, but barely knows you. We could have that, right? We could have the best parents who are the best provider, but we barely know them because we can hardly see them around. But we have Jesus. And Jesus not only has laid down his own life for you. He knows you through and through. That there is never no room for miscommunication with Jesus. He understands you completely. Even from every temptations that you face. What better high priest do we have than someone who knows what we're going through and sympathizes with us? And that's why he can deal gently with us. We have a high priest who's fulfilled the requirement because the high priest's role is to make the people right before God. And you know what? This high priest is the propitiation for our sins himself. This wonderful high priest is propitiation. I told you this before, right? Means full satisfaction. The high priest, the only high priest that could fully satisfy every requirement of God for you. This is Jesus, the high priest. Who else is better than that? And not only that, 
You know, when we are dealing with our own temptations, what we do is this. Oh Lord, I'm tempted. Struggle, struggle, struggle. Struggle, struggle, struggle. Give in. <laughs> okay, let me do it again. Oh, I'm tempted to get angry. Oh, I'm tempted by my pride. I'm tempted by, by desires, right? And what do we do? Oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Okay. Right? Right? We've never, at all 100% of the time, started resisting and battling and, and dealing with our temptations from, end, from, finish, from start to end. We give up halfway. We give up midway. We give up three-fourth of the way. We give up one-fourth of the way. And then we go to Jesus, Lord, please forgive me. But you have a high priest who at the worst points of his life, you saw him crying, pleading, but you saw him from start to finish, consistent all the time. Sinless. Resisted the temptation. He, who among you here knows fully the extent of what someone going through temptation really feels. None of us do. But you have a high priest who does from start to finish all the way. You don't want somebody who, do, who, who, who don't know his ABCs teaching you how to make sentences, right? You want somebody with a master's degree, even something, someone more than that, qualified to teach you things, to lead you to things. And you have a high priest who has fully qualified and more. And now he's praying, and this is the, the moment of, 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 of Gethsemane here, and to the one, to the Father, who's able to save him from death. And I love that. You can underline it in your Bible from one simple word, common word in English. But you know what? That's the word ek. And the ek means it's something that's coming from within, going outside. Out of death, you could say. And if I'm understanding it right, then do you know what Jesus was praying for in Gethsemane? He's saying, Lord, you're the only one who can deliver me from death. He's not saying, save me from suffering and death. He's saying, you are going to be the only one to resurrect me from the dead. Jesus was praying about the resurrection. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And because you have a high priest that you saw, Winning every step of the way with every temptation. You have a high priest that you saw pray to the Father, the one with the power to resurrect and rescue us from death. And you saw him rise, from, rise up from uh, three days later. We believe that. We believe in the resurrected Christ. Then, what has life got to offer you to make you scared? You have someone who can save you and take you out from death. You could say, my life is meaningless here, suffering here and everything here. I died too early. I died too long. I died with so much pain and suffering. You're never going to be, you're going to never lose this full satisfaction of living life for God because you have someone who is able to save you from death. You will raise. You will be raised from the dead you will resurrect like Jesus Christ. Full satisfaction no matter your circumstance. And you see that the best of us, Jesus Christ, when he prayed, he was heard. And the piety there, in the King James Version, it says fear, but it's, it's talking about his reverence, his submission, his obedience to the will of God. So you have someone who's fulfilled every requirement of God to be the high priest and more. And you know what? Why Jesus is simply better, better high priest, better, better than angels, better than prophets, because he is God's best for you. Simply saying God's best for you. But I have a problem with the, the word, the, 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 the way we understand God's best. You see, the first time I encountered God's best, I heard it used in a, in a way by a person that was seeking to get married. See, he was single. You can also say she was single. 
and she was looking for a spouse. And the loneliness in her heart saying, oh, I, I, I want to I wanna wait on the Lord because I want to have God's best. And even in seminary, I, I, it became a joke. We would say, oh, where's your God's best? And it's always in relation to finding a spouse. But I have a problem with that. Why? Because your understanding of God's best understood that way is that this. Right now, I don't have God's best. I'm missing something. And I'm looking at them and they have God's best. I'm some, seeing somebody in a mall walking hand, hand in hand, H-H-W-W, and you know what? Holding hands while walking. And, 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 and you say, oh, they have God's best. Right? Because it's coming, it's not coming from a heart that's fully satisfied. It's a dissatisfied heart. You're saying, I, I will only be happy and satisfied if you got, I get God's best. You mean to tell me you don't have God's best right now? I have a problem with that. You see, it's, it's not only in romantic, linked romantically, it's also linked with having favorable circumstance. And that's why you could say, promotion, I, I just want God's best for my career. And you mean promotion. So when you, you look at others being promoted, wow, they have God's best. Your God's best is like, this, this guy has a car, this has a brand new house and lot. Oh, I want that. I want God's best. And you, what, what you will do is that you will wake up in every morning, look at your one side of the wall of your house and you're going to say, wow, so many God, God's best out there. Ah. And you're going to look at your life and you say, how about me? Wala. Wala God's best. Only God's good. God is good all the time. All the time God is good. Yes, but I don't have God's best. And so what are you doing? You're, you're dissatisfied. You're looking, oh, I have so many problems. I don't have God's best. I, I need God's best. And you're going to look and you're going to fall for a lie. You're going to fall for a different and, and a false gospel who's going to offer you best, the best of men, the best of the world. And you're going to say, oh, this is God's best. And you're going to get fooled. And you're going to go to, you're going to, go to your destruction. Why? Because you never have received God's best. Jesus is God's best. You have a God who's per, who's whole character and being is love and loving you and giving you the best. He is the God who says, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you. You don't teach God what is best for you. God teaches you what is best for you. God directs you to do best for, that is best for you. You see, God's best, that is Jesus Christ, went through suffering. He went through because God directed him. It was part and parcel of his obedience. God's best saw a Jesus Christ, we see, went through suffering, rejection, and pain, and death, and that was the best. It resulted in all of us singing and will sing forever. Praise be your name, Jesus. Praise be your name, O God. You have saved us. Oh, wretched we are. We are helpless and hopeless. We don't deserve this, but you laid down your life for us. But he went through suffering. He went through pain. God's best is Jesus Christ. And the moment you believe Christ, you have God's best. You are in your heart transformed, renewed, and have received the grace of God, the best grace there is. You already have God's best. Beware those who will feed you, who will feed you and your fear of missing out. They'll say, you have that? There's more. Covet. Envy more. Desire. And they'll sugarcoat it with, have more faith. Believe. And you'll receive. Name it. And you'll get it. Beware, beware of those who will sow discontent in your heart. That you will say, they will say to you, Jesus is not enough. You need more. Jesus alone is not good enough. You need to be more holy. Jesus, not good enough. You need to do more things. Be more like this. Live like this. Have those things. Beware. Beware. Circumstances right now, difficult circumstances make you vulnerable, I know. That's why it's no accident we're talking Hebrews here. 
Look at Jesus. Listen to Jesus. He's better. He's the best. He is God's best. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. God's best, you see, went through suffering as well. And he learned obedience. Not that he was a sinner. And all of us, you know, we're, we're, we're small. We learn from pain. But Jesus Christ was sinless. He learned obedience. What does it mean? It's the sufferings which Jesus endured were the very means which He fulfilled the will of God. When you say Jesus Christ had to learn, in a sense, that He is God way before time began, but is in a sense, He was in the flesh. The cost of obedience, the suffering that is part and parcel of obedience, that's what Jesus also learn and having been made perfect and you could say jesus is already perfect yes what's that supposed to mean then perfectly qualified he is he became perfectly qualified why you have a perfect jesus a perfect high priest who is not just on theory an obedient son but now proven and tested that means my dear friends jesus is proven and tested his obedience, his submission, his faith, his love for you, proven and tested. His grace for you, proven and tested. You have that high priest. Why go where there's, you're, they're already proven to be inconsistent and insufficient? Why sink your hopes or anchor them? Anchor in Christ, my dear friends. Because he is the one who the happy result of him being perfectly qualified, going through all the way from start to finish, carrying out the, the, the Lord's plan to save us all. He became the source of eternal salvation to everyone. And this, those who obey, that's simply those who believe. You see, this is an obedience that comes from faith. This is an obedience that comes from someone who's saying, Jesus, I'm fully satisfied in you. So no matter what you tell me, no matter where I'm, you lead me, I'll follow. I'll hear your voice and I know it's you. You're my master. That is com the comes from faith who believes that Jesus is the best. Jesus is God's best. And the moment you believe him, you have God's best. You have the source of your eternal salvation able to satisfy you yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Jikaf, be satisfied in Jesus. Can we give God a mighty clap of praise? Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful that we have you that could satisfy even, Lord, not just our eternal salvation, but the yearnings of our heart to be joy-filled, that our heart yearns to be happy, and you don't want us to settle for the rest. You want us to settle for the best. And that is Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help people here who are struggling with sins because they're not yet satisfied to learn, to look at your word and know the truth and love the truth. That it is in you we will only be fully satisfied. Thank you so much, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.